right. Welcome to the Arium podcast. This podcast covers topics related to cyber and human resilience. It's geared towards owners and CEOs of small to medium-sized companies, as well as IT and cybersecurity leaders. My name is Bill Bowman, and I'm the marketing director here at Arium. My co-host for today's episode is Art O'Kane. Art is the field CISO and CIO at Arium. How are you doing today, Art? I am muted as usual. So uh, you know me, Bill. I'm really kind of just running on a lack of sleep, caffeine, anxiety, and, and really uh, always on fire. So I'm glad to be here. It's a break from, uh, you know, stop dropping and rolling. Nice. Well, we're here, we're recording on a Friday, so hopefully you'll have a some a weekend to reduce the anxiety and maybe increase the caffeine. So, but Fridays stuff. are the worst. Fridays are the worst days in incident response. So <laughs> they it's are. They be are. A bad day for Art. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we'll see if it improves for him. But our guest for today is Tony Kirtley. Mm-hmm. Tony is the director of cyber risk partnerships at SecureWorks. Tony has a ton of experience in both the civilian world and the military world where he leads teams and helps organizations. SecureWorks is a cybersecurity company that offers the Tagus XDR and provides a variety of services such as threat intelligence, incident response, and vulnerability management. Uh, this, this protects organizations from cyber threats and Arium is a proud partner of SecureWorks. So how are you doing today, Tony? I'm doing great, Bill. Thanks for having me on the podcast. And I have to correct the pronunciation of our <laughs> flagship product. It's actually Tagus. Tagus, all right. Tagus XDR, and we're very proud of that product. Excellent, excellent. So we're going to learn more about that product and other things in today's episode. So we're going to be also be focusing on you know what happens on the front lines of ransomware recovery. There are a lot of emotions, a lot of human drama happening in these very stressful situations. Uh, in addition, we'll give some tips for companies to be more resilient. So if an incident occurs, they can stand back up. And we'll also give some tips to help how, how to help uh, lessen the likelihood of an incident happening. So let's kick things off. And we'd like to kick things off with the question for all of our guests to get to know them a little bit better. So our question is, you know, Tony, what what is your morning routine? How do you how do you get ready to make the most of the day? Well, I'm not a roll out of bed and jump right in kind of guy. I like to I like to start slow and turn the brain on, you know, catch up with family. So typically when I wake up, I'll get a cup of coffee for my wife and me uh, and and chill in bed for a little bit, catch up. And uh, I like to do the world, uh, <laughs> the day's wordle at the beginning of the day, honestly, it turns my brain on, gets me thinking about something that's not really important, but just turns the brain on. And then as my daughters are getting ready for school, I like to catch up with them. And and then ultimately when I sit down at my desk, I, I look at my calendar, see what I've got for the day, make sure that um, I'm ready for the slew of meetings in the morning. We, we deal a lot with uh, people from uh, the UK. So my mornings are full of meetings where in the middle of the day, it's, you know, a little less. And then, uh, so I might do some planning for the next day during that time. But, um, but yeah, that's, that's kind of what my, the start of my day looks like. Sounds like a good, and you're coming, you're, you're in, you're in St. Louis, right? So yeah, I'm in central time. So yeah, yeah. so you got the UK and St. Louis, you got the and I've got colleagues in Australia that I work with at the end of the day. So, <laughs> you know, got it on both ends. Nice, nice. So to kick things off, you know, can you tell us a little bit about how SecureWorks keeps keeps companies safe, the XDR platform and everything, just to give a, give a little bit about the company? Yeah, well, a couple of years ago, we started to develop Tagus XDR, and uh, it's a complete redesign from our previous uh, platforms. Uh, and it was designed to be cloud native and an open platform to plug and, and ingest any information. Uh, well, to a point, uh, endpoint information, uh, infrastructure, cloud, and various security technologies. And the number of security technologies keeps growing with our integrations. Um, and we use all of that data to detect threat activity in a customer's environment. 
And the detections that are built into the platform are really our secret sauce and they're fed into it by our, and developed by our counter threat unit we call the CTU. And they're just a world-class uh, group of researchers that focus on nothing else but you know, gathering threat intelligence, turning it into detectors and intelligence that our customers can use. And frankly, our, our consulting teams can use as well. Um, we, we offer serv a services wrapper for our technology. Uh, we can monitor it 24 by seven from our stocks around the world. Uh, we can also just offer the technology and we also have partners that are MSSPs that leverage the platform to monitor customers' environments. Now, Tejas and, is an awesome platform. Um, I've seen it on incident response. And in addition to this proactive stuff that you're talking about here, uh, it, it's something that can be added after an incident to help gather the logs in the story um, and assist with that that incident from a forensic side, right? Absolutely, yeah. Our incident response team uses Tejas in the uh, investigations. And during that time, I mean, we allow the customer to see uh, what we're doing in the platform. And oftentimes they don't want us to take it away after the engagement <laughs> and end up signing a contract with us, which is you know, ultimately where we want to be. We want to enter into those long-term partnerships with, with customers to watch their environment and keep them out of the trouble they were just in. Nice. So, so how does, you know, you mentioned incidents happen, Tejas comes in. So how does SecureWorks collaborate with partners on, on engagements uh, related to disaster recovery? I know, I know Arium's a, a partner, so very proud yeah. of that. Yeah, so um, we made the decision a long time ago of, about what we would do and what we would not do. We want to focus on our core competency, which is the Tejas platform. And so um, we only have two consulting practices that supplement that. We have an adversarial testing uh, team, uh, which is also very good and very large. There are about 100 uh, consultants and our incident response team. Uh, and so we decided a long time ago that we're, we didn't want to be in the business of providing that um, hands-on keyboard rebuilding uh, kind of effort. And so uh, I found Arium about a year ago um, in Fort Lauderdale at a conference and just started chatting and working through an agreement. And here we are. And I think one of the, the things that's great is is the amount of focus that allows both of us to do when we're working together on an incident. Like SecureWorks is really handling the investigation and the response, which is what they're awesome at. And then they're really covering our backs while we're able to rebuild for the client. And so I think that combination is really allowing the client's outcomes to be a lot better. Is yeah. allowing everybody to be focused and the client to get up and, and running faster. Yeah, and it, it to to echo what Art was saying, you know, we want to do what we do best, and what we want to allow Arium to do what they do, what you do best. So I think it's a great partnership. Excellent, excellent. So Art, Tony, you you guys both have a lot of experience when incidents happen. You get the call, you get the email. I guess you both can comment, you know, what, what's it like? The adrenaline starts pumping, <laughs> ready to rush into action. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, it is uh, it's somewhat that way, no matter how many times you do uh, these types of engagements, uh, responding to ransomware, it's there's always an element of adrenaline. But at a certain point, uh, we, we, it becomes a matter of process and we just execute the processes. Uh, imagine going to an emergency room and the doctors where hair was on fire, you know, you're in there, you've got a lot of anxiety being the patient, but if the doctors have to be calm, they have to show you that they know what they're doing. And so we, we have to be those doctors for the victims of ransomware because it is a very, uh, stressful situation to say the least for the victims and having gone through it over and over and knowing what the outcomes should be and how to get there we have to present that calm 
to the, the customer, the victim, so that they can start to build faith and um, know that they're going to get out of this okay. So yeah, there is excitement, but at the same time, calm. Uh, and so I think that's imperative for people who do what we do, right, Art? Yeah. Yeah, I think if our team is getting super amped up and excited about something, it's usually because of empathy with the victim. You know, usually it's it's the victim is so excited because they're looking, this could be a business ending event for them and it's affecting their reputation and there's a lot of negative repercussions for them if it goes wrong. And although we've been through it, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times you know that sometimes those feelings are translated to our team a little bit uh so it, it's our job to make sure that everybody's calm going going through this and uh and yeah it, it does nobody uh you know any favors by being um you know super reactive to the uh you know the anxiety of the event and it's better if we're if we're sticking to that process, like Tony said. Definitely. So keep keeping keeping calm. You know, probably calms the person that you're helping out as well. So w when you're on an incident, what what's the day to day like conceptually? I, I've never been on one on the marketing side. So what what are you doing? What's uh, how how is time being used, and what are the kind of the steps that you're taking to to help out these organizations that have fallen fallen victim to ransomware or other other situations? Yeah, uh, I, I think that from my perspective in the role that I played in incident response up until about six months ago, uh, for me, it was uh, a lot of time was spent communicating, not only communicating to the teams doing the response to the to the technical teams at the customer to the uh, the management to the lawyers, all of those things, everyone has to have that communication. Uh, and it is part of what is going to calm the the victim a little bit. Uh, you have a you have to acknowledge that there's a an elephant in the room, and you have to tell them how you're going to eat the elephant. <laughs> and the the sooner you can walk them through that, give them that confidence, uh, the better it will go. And you won't you won't have to battle them uh, if you're feeding and proactively giving those uh, communications. Um, and then from a technical standpoint, you know, we've always got the, the containment that has to happen before Art and his team can, can start to recover. So we try to achieve the containment as soon as possible because you don't want uh, the recovery to start and then have to re-recover some of the assets because the threat actor hasn't been effectively uh, contained. And then you have the eradication and, and then of course the recovery, uh, I wanted to, before I kick it over to Art to get his perspective, talk about from the, from SecureWorks perspective, we always, we have, we do the investigation and we need data. We need data as it, uh, after the compromise to do the investigation. And there's always a, there is a lot of time, not always, I guess, uh, a conflict between the customer wants to recover they still want to know what happened and if data was taken, uh, but they also want to get back to business. And so there's often a conflict with storage. Uh, how can you recover while preserving that data? And so uh, that's kind of a struggle that we have to manage as uh, the leads of the incident. And so I'll, I'll let Art give his perspective. Absolutely. That is probably one of the bigger obstacles in this is uh when we're recovering, you know, usually we're having to preserve artifacts and for a forensic investigation, for, uh, you know, figuring out what data was exfiltrated, if any, uh, figure out what happened and, uh, and, and any legal responsibility behind that requires that investigation. And of course, the business wants to get back to production as fast as possible. So everybody's moving as fast as we can. Uh, but ultimately, you know, it takes time for the data to be collected and it takes time for these for forensic images to be gathered and uh, for artifacts to be gathered. So it's uh, that can slow down recovery at the beginning. So we try to do as much as we can in parallel. If a company has a ton of storage, we'll contain 
and start recovering while preserving those artifacts. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, in most cases, companies run lean and you don't have 200% of the available storage. Like you don't have enough hard drive space for us to keep going. So we, we've come up with other ways to bring in storage to help, you know, during those events. But yeah, that is the thing that can slow down a company getting back up and running. And it, it's a necessary part of this. So there's always this pressure at the beginning in those first like 72 hours. Uh, like, when are we going to get our critical systems up? When are we going to get this up? You know, that kind of thing. And usually we're, we're, we're still gathering artifacts in that investigation in, the, in that time. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So the, the the company they want they want things to happen now, but always do things do take time as as that. So yeah, speaking, I mean, it's yeah. it's pressure from the board uh, yeah. mm -hmm. to the CIO and the leadership saying, "Hey, when are we gonna get recovered? When are we gonna we gonna be able to resume business?" And uh, setting those expectations with the board and with senior leadership is very important. Uh, you don't want to say you're going to do it too fast and then not hit that mark because that just causes uh, frustration at those levels, which you don't want in those situations. Interesting. So the technical aspects of getting getting back, handling the storage, doing the recovery, containing, and then building building the systems back up are one part. In, in parallel, you got the emotions of the company leaders and, and the board, other other people. You know what? What are the stages that people go through that the victims go through in in the case of a you know a, a big ransomware, big cybersecurity incident? This is a very interesting topic for me. I did a presentation at first in Ireland in June, uh, actually in early July, uh, about this topic and the emotional uh, stages that ransomware victims go through, and the presentation. Kind of drew parallels between ransomware victims and people who suffer losses uh, and the the kubler ross stages of grief uh, which are denial anger bargaining depression and acceptance um, and some people may be familiar with that model uh, and drawing the parallel between victims of ransomware is kind of a loose analogy but it works in a way too because uh, what we as uh, response professionals need to do is to help the, the victim manage those emotions and get to acceptance as quickly as possible. Um, and the reason for that is if they're uh, struggling with these other emotions while trying to respond, as we all know, speed is of the essence in uh, ransomware response. And that stage of acceptance that we need to get them to allows them to start making decisions that are sound and uh, learn to accept that they do need help getting to uh, business as usual as quickly as possible. With teams like yours, you know, uh, I've often gone on site and uh, identify very quickly based on the situation that uh, recovery help is needed. They can't do it by themselves but sometimes leadership struggles with the additional cost or the complication that that may uh, introduce. But I, I found that when they can come to that conclusion more quickly and accept that they can't do this on their own uh, as far as rebuilding their environment and can bring in a recovery expert quickly, then uh, it greatly helps the, the response time and reduces the response time. How about um, during those incidents when they're obviously going through these stages and uh, they don't really want you to take control of the incident as a result? <laughs> like they think that they're uh, actually okay take managing it on their own uh, and, and you were just brought in kind of as help. Um, how do you help them through those that thinking so that they're able to think about, you know, accepting that help? Um, the, you always have your contentious or territorial CISO, uh, that thinks you're just going to take them for a ride or they don't, they don't really need to, to pay the money they're paying for you and that you're trying to gouge them. But, uh, that's where the interaction with those, um, people comes in uh, critical 
to show them by uh, the stuff that you're presenting that you do know what you're doing and they do need you to help out. I mean, who wants to go through a ransomware for the first time, not ab- having ever been through it? It just makes sense to to bring in the professionals that see this day after day. Mm-hmm. And so um, I've seen uh, lots of different emotional and even physical responses to ransomware. In fact, I had one customer, I use this customer as a uh, for the, as a reference, not a reference, but I refer to this engagement a lot in the different aspects. One, they came to acceptance very quickly and brought, we brought in a recovery partner before we knew Arium, uh, in, in on that one immediately and it went well, but the, on day one, the, uh, IT director checked himself into a hospital. He had oh, had wow. a panic attack. Wow. He just was just besides himself. He didn't know where to even begin. And then by the time we got there, I, I got there the next day and uh, resumed the duties of the IT director and, you know, of course, incident commander. So um, I, I never met the guy. I would like to meet him to just kind of see what he went through. But um, I've also had CIOs almost have a heart attack in front of my eyes. I mean, I remember sitting in a conference room with the CIO general counsel. We were on the phone with outside counsel and the CIO just turned white. And I looked at him, I said, are you okay? And, you know, we had to kind of make sure that his health was good because we couldn't, um, couldn't lose him in that situation. So the emotions that people go through are immense. And uh, it's, it's part of our jobs, you know, not only to be the, the technical experts, but to also uh, recognize when we need to hold the hand of the victim a little bit more on an emotional level and, uh, and be that for them as well. Yeah, I, I wow. think that we've, that exact thing has happened. We've seen that several times um, where we're working with a client and the uh, whether it's the CTO, the CIO, the CISO, uh, or the IT director goes to the hospital. Um, a lot of times, you know, just under the anxiety they're they've been working, you know, three days back to back, uh, you know, pulling all nighters before they've even tried to call cyber insurance and gotten help and brought us in and, and that kind of thing. And um, as a result, you know, they were already checked into the hospital by the time we came on site. So uh, that kind of reaction is is something that is 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 a lot more common than I think people realize that. You know, you're when you're in an incident response, what happens if those key individuals end up having to go to the hospital, and what happens to your incident response plan then? That kind of thing is something that maybe we should start thinking about when we're working with customers developing their uh, incident response plans. Yeah, we always, in our plans that we develop, designate a primary and a back and a backup at a minimum contact for each role. Uh, you, you have to do that. And those backup contacts need to know uh, what that the responsibilities of that role are. I mean, as a backup, people can blow it off and not even worry about it, but uh, it's very a very, very real situation where they may be called to execute duties that they're not used to doing. So that's that's quite quite an emotional situation. So you guys have to be therapists a little bit. You have to hold the hand. Yeah. You have to be the expert in the technical field of standing back up. So Tony, I, I notice I notice some some military. Um, items in the background i know uh, so i want to say thank you for your service did your experience or your current your experience in the past or are you still in the military in the national guard tony no i retired from the national guard in 2014 so seems like a long time ago (laughs) so Uh, how did did how did that time in the military help you today help you in the incidents that you're you're responding to well, I think first and foremost, um, it's it taught me a mindset, uh, mission first, spe- specifically that mindset where uh, that that kind of prompts you to dig deep uh, to do what it takes to accomplish the mission. And um, 
Also, I would say it, it kind of gave me perspective uh, in a way. So I served for 22 years uh, and during the course of my career, all of it was in the National Guard except for a couple of deployments. And those deployments were 14 or 15 months and 12 months, five years apart. And uh, that gave me a, a great perspective with regard to deploying for two weeks on a ransomware mission, uh, not knowing when I'm coming home. So in those 15 and 12 month deployments, I only had one leave where I got to come home and see my family. And so next to that, going to uh, somewhere stateside where I had full communication, not full amount of time to communicate, but uh, I could communicate home or my, my family knew I was coming home in two weeks or so, sometime sooner. Uh, it, it paled in comparison to what I had done before. So, um, and, and, uh, doing what we do, helping, uh, victims of ransomware get back on their feet, uh, after the worst day in their career, you know, it's, it pales in comparison to the, the effort that I had gone through in the military. And then, uh, lastly, I would say, uh, before I retired, I led a team of cyber experts, really, really smart guys. And we're doing a lot of great things and building a capability. And uh, when you have smart people, and Art could attest to this, I'm sure, it's easy for them to get distracted with shiny objects. Oh, look at this new tool. Let's go play with that. And so I found that um, I became the guy who just kept the shiny objects and distractions away from the team to help them focus on the mission. And so um, those kinds of things I carry over into, into my civilian career. Nice, that, that focus, that, that discipline and perspective, right? I, yeah. I can understand that. Thank you again for your, for your service. Um, switching back to you know, the practical elements of, of falling victim to ransomware, ransomware recovery, how, you know, what are some of the common ways that people are falling victim, that organizations and companies are, are falling victim to attacks? I'm sure there's a, a myriad of ways. <laughs> there's whole frameworks about it. But what, what are you seeing out there that's one of the most common or some of the common ones? Well, the number of ways that threat actors get in aren't as vast as you might think. Uh, in fact, uh, SecureWorks publishes a state of the threat report uh, at the end of every year. And for the last two years in a row, the most common attack vector for threat actors of ransomware is uh, exploiting a, a vulnerability on a public facing facility. So we call it the scan and exploit uh, attack vector. And over 50% of the ransomware uh, engagements we responded to the last two years were that was the attack vector. And so uh, just patching, uh, can help with that. And that's a matter of hygiene. And there are great, there are tools that help um, help people, help IT professionals manage patching, but ultimately uh, it doesn't cost anything in most cases to patch uh, as long as they're up on, you know, maintenance on software they're patching. So uh, it can be done on the cheap. However, to do it effectively and to properly prioritize uh, there are tools to help with that, but I would say that um, the next is hygiene around accounts. We see account compromise as uh, the second most uh, attack vector. And then once the threat actor is in the environment, uh, there's all kinds of account compromise that happens. Uh, password uh, scraping once they're in, and that's how they escalate to uh, domain admin. And then lastly, uh, visibility, I would say there's still companies that don't have endpoint visibility, which just blows my mind in this day and age. Uh, you've got to be watching the environment because uh, prevention has long been considered not 100% effective. Mm -hmm. uh, the determined threat actor is going to be able to get in. And so you have to be able to detect and respond to that uh, entry and you have to have the visibility of your, of your assets in order to do that. Nice. Are any, any, 
any common ways that you're seeing out there? You echo Tony's insights yeah. on patching, definitely. So I'm a patching fanatic, and that's <laughs> one of the things that you know I've spoken at MITRE about this year, and a, a bunch of different uh, talks about really the the importance of patching as in, in becoming a resilient company. Is you know if you're going to bounce back from attack, really you're one of the things you have to do is really limit the effect of the attack, and you're doing that by by patching those systems so the threat actor has less options. Yes, a determined threat actor is going to find a way in, um, but the more you're patched, the less opportunity they have. Um, so one of the other vectors that we're seeing a lot is just uh, attacker already has your creds through credential theft or phishing or whatever, and they're just logging into your VPN. Um, and at that point, they've already gotten past that external service that's that's um, published to the world, they're already inside your network. So then that lateral movement around the network, the, the, they got in through VPN and now they're just jumping around as a user on your network. But uh, the ability to gain persistence and, and, and move around your network a lot of times is because of that lack of patching also. It's, and that hygiene. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if the accounts were managed properly, if people weren't all administrators, you know that the threat actor would able be able to do a lot less when they gained access but uh in the end that dwell time that the the fact that the attacker can get in and then spend their take their time moving around your network is because you don't have that visibility if you had tages xdr on your network you would be caught <laughs> you, you know that the uh yeah, the threat actor might get in the front door and is two machines in before, uh, you know, Tejas is shutting them down, but they're not fully uh, navigating and owning your domain. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so it's, it's that's where that kind of visibility um, comes in. I want to I wanted to point uh, something Art said made me remember that uh, we like to, to tell just from our experience that most uh, organizations aren't targeted. Uh, there, there are some organizations that are targeted by threat actors, but uh, ransomware is opportunistic. The threat actor is going to find who is weak and and exploit them. They're not uh, spending a lot of time trying to get into a network. Uh, once they run into roadblocks, they're probably going on to the next one. So uh, the more that organizations can do to make themselves even stronger than the next organization, it, it's to their advantage because they're, they don't have to build a fortress. They just have to have the, the visibility and the basic um, kind of walls around their assets uh, that Art and I have talked about. Nice, nice. So that's all great advice. Any, any final advice, any final thing to share with, with our listeners here before we, before we wrap up the discussion? Yeah, I think I wanted to dig in a little more to the importance of Active Directory. In 100% of the cases we see, Active Directory is an issue and domain admin is achieved because as Art and I would, uh, I, I think Art would agree that uh, for ransomware, domain admin is essential in deploying and detonating ransomware at scale. And it needs to be done at scale or to, to achieve the maximum effect. So at, if organizations could pay attention to the security features built into Active Directory, not just the functionality, which I think most Active Directory instances were implemented with just the basic functionality, but there's a whole enterprise model, uh, enterprise access model that Microsoft recommends that I would suggest to companies to pay attention to and implement as much as they can of that enterprise access model. And that will get them a long way towards uh, kind of preventing and putting up roadblocks in their network for the threat actors. We've always got the things that the controls that are recommended, like incident response planning, backups, uh, multi-factor authentication. Uh, but I think that Active Directory is something, securing Active Directory is something that, that not enough people are talking about in to make a company resilient. 
Absolutely. I think that uh, by taking advantage of Active Directory, the threat actors are, are able to really do whatever they want once they get into most networks. So uh, taking steps to harden that and secure that properly and implement an architecture uh, using that that is is really structured right uh, mm -hmm. to prevent the threat actor from just doing whatever is, is important. And then once that's set up right, then other things like further, you know, identity based, um, you know, network segmentation, things like that, uh, you know, zero trust approaches can be implemented once you're actually taking care of how your directory works. So if you think about really our vulnerability as being our people and when i when i mean when i talk about our people i mean our identities in active directory uh once the threat actor has that your identity source they're able to do whatever they want on your network so that's why we're, we're signaling to businesses that there's probably some more effort that needs to take place if you have internal it uh leverage them to investigate how to uh, secure Active Directory and build in better, uh, more secure zero trust type architectures around Active Directory. But if you don't, then bringing in a security company uh, like us, you know, would would definitely help implementing that kind of a, um, you know, that solution for you. Awesome. So those are two low cost or no cost things that a, you know, a small company, a medium sized company can can do today. Start mm -hmm. patching and get your get your AD instance configured correctly because all the tools are there, but people just may not may not be exactly. doing it. <laughs> yep. Great. Um, yeah. Any any final thoughts, Tony? No, I'm good, Bill. Great. Thanks great. For having me. Excellent. So I hope everyone enjoyed the discussion. We got a little bit better insights and, and understanding of the emotions and the human side of ransomware recovery with those um, with those that insight and stories from Art and Tony. And I hope everyone enjoyed the episode and please subscribe to this podcast in whatever platform you are listening in. New episodes will typically be released every other Wednesday. For more information on SecureWorks, you can visit secureworks.com. And for more information on Arium, you can visit Arium.com. Thanks.